starting in just a couple minutes. Appreciate everybody's participation today. I would like to thank everyone for joining. We'll be starting in just a minute. Evoqua Water Technologies would love to extend a warm welcome to all participants of today's webinar, Sanitization Methods for Pharmaceutical Water Systems. My name is Mike Costello. I am the Product Manager for Systems at Evoqua Water Technologies, and I would like to thank my good friend Gary Zaccolani for presenting the webinar today. Many of you already know Gary Zaccolani of Plymouth Rock Water Consultants. Gary has almost a half century of water experience, primarily focused in pharmaceutical systems. He is over 35 years with Evoqua as the pharmaceutical technical director. He's a committee member of ISPE Baseline Water and Steam System Guide. Over his career, Gary has developed multiple patents and published several technical papers on a wide array of topics, including some of the material that he will be sharing with us today. This webinar is being recorded and can be viewed again at a later date. And with that, I'd like to hand that over to Gary Zaccolani. Thank you, Gary. Thanks, Mike, for having me. I'm really happy to be here today. Um, we're going to proceed straight through the material um, without taking questions. We have a lot of material to get through. There should be time at the end. We'll answer as many as we can. So the instructions are here. You're going to click on the bar below the gray circle. That should give you a window. You can type your question in the window and click send to submit the question. And again, we will take as many as we can. So we're going to talk today about the various methods for sanitization of pharmaceutical water systems. We'll be looking at heat sanitization, ozone sanitization, and chemicals. And although it is primarily aimed at pharma systems, these technologies can certainly apply to pure water systems in many markets. 
We are first going to do a high-level overview of sanitization. Why would you do it? Where? How can you do it? How can you determine the frequency? And then we will drill down deeper into how you can actually accomplish the methods. We'll look at generation and storage and distribution, what regulatory impact there might be, um, safety and summary. So first, we're talking about sanitization. And if you look up sanitization and sterilization, um, both from a generic standpoint and an FDA standpoint, although I will show you where FDA mentions a requirement for sanitization, I can't really find that term defined in 21 CFR where we'll see that sterilization is. So sanitization generically, um, and, and this is combining a lot of definitions, eliminate most harmful microorganisms capable of reproduction. And that reproduction means possibly infection. So that's removing it from surfaces. So it's not a complete elimination. If you think of it then in pharmaceutical water, any contact surface that the water is going to contact um, may require sanitization, and those surfaces need to be protected, not necessarily completely from any biofilm formation, but ideally minimizing it, limiting it, so that the then micro contamination level of the water um, is consistently good enough for production of the products that you're going to make. Sterilization is defined in a few different places, but in this one in sterility of equipment, condition achieved by application of heat, chemical sterilants, or other appropriate treatment that renders the equipment free of organisms capable of reproducing. So in that case, sterilization, that would be a goal of sanitization to eliminate them. It isn't a requirement. And when you're in doing sanitizing, even if you never got a micro count in your water, you could never call that sterile. To be sterile water from a, a USP standpoint, from an FDA standpoint, it would have to be packaged, terminally sterilized in a validated procedure with very specific sterility tests. So the aim here is gonna be to get rid of most organisms, um, and keep a water system in control. Why do systems need sanitization? First, we'll see it's a good manufacturing practice requirement. Um, even though there are relatively low nutrient levels in pharma water systems, some organisms can survive. And if they do, and if they proliferate to a, a point beyond control, it could cause a product failure. It could interrupt production. It could cause equipment failure. Even if you never make a bad product, if you're having micro failures in the system, that can trigger investigations, um, additional testing costs. So the micro getting out of control is not a good thing in pharma water. Here, in the GMP's 21167A, equipment shall be cleaned, maintained, and sanitized at levels, and then basically, simplistically, the rest of that, it's to prevent a failure of the product, a failure of the drug product. So here, sanitized is mentioned, again, a perfect definition, not provided, people understand it means keeping the water system in control to consistently meet the requirements. Here, um, with all due credit to Mr. Wincheck from Roman Haas, who put this nice slide together, this is to show the speed at which microbes can attach to surfaces and begin the biofilm formation. So, there can be reversible attachment in seconds. That can become irreversible seconds to minutes. Now the growth and division of bacteria and within hours to days, the EPS secretion. So the 
extracellular polymeric substance or exopolymer. That's the formation of the biofilm. It toughens it. It makes it harder for things to penetrate to get at the microbes. Um, so it, it does not take long if the bacteria are not seeing a lethal condition. It does not take long for the biofilm formation to begin. Where do you have to be able to sanitize a pharma system? The generation system and potentially at every unit process. So at the start of a system where there may be residual chlorine, there's pretty low risk, say at depth filters, softeners may be in that chlorinated stream. But after dechlorination, carbon is probably the highest risk because everything is there to support microbial growth. But I'm a big carbon fan. It certainly can be managed. And other components post dechlorination, tanks, RO, there's certainly moderate risk. Electrodeionization, because of the electric field and water splitting, they're pretty self protective. Um, and then again, filters are back at the moderate risk level. And that is a function of many things. What is the water spec? What is the system design? There are many, many factors that could shift these around a little. In storage and distribution, the chemical sanitization, it's workable. Um, it's the least robust. So in purified water, that could be a moderate risk for microbial contamination. It, it really is not recommended for water for injection and shouldn't be considered. But then either heat intermittently or continuously, um, low risk for most waters, and again, Putting a moderate on intermediate heat and water for injection, it may just mean the outer half of a diaphragm valve. Maybe it isn't quite getting up to temperature. It's a cold area, a hose practices. Um, but certainly the systems can be designed with heat to stay in specification. And the same with ozone. Um, ozone is the fastest growing of these sanitization procedures and it certainly um, can keep systems under control. How can you sanitize? We're gonna look at hot water and steam for thermal, ozone and chemical, and those agents, it could be intermittently or continuously supplied. So as an example, if a tank is always at 80 degrees C or is always under ozone, that would be continuous sanitization. If it is simply intermittent, daily, weekly, monthly, that is intermittent. And some of you may have systems, simple systems, some service, ion exchange tanks, carbon, a filter. And you may think that there's not any sanitization you can think of. Um, first, a system should be able to be sanitized in some way, but that could be vendor sanitization of components off-site, or it could be replacement, replacement of tanks, replacement of filters. So those also contribute to accomplishing micro control and sanitization. If we think of continuous sanitization, um, and that may be applied at the tank level for sure, and sometimes at the loop level, that really limits it to ozone or high temperature. Chemicals, most of them, the byproducts are either gonna contribute to conductivity or some water failure. When it's high temperature, if the water is generated hot, say off of a hot still, then continuous heat can be perfect, especially if the water's used hot. If the water is generated at ambient temperature, ozone may be ideal. Um, and we'll see even from a regulatory standpoint that's being proposed for consideration. With continuous, there's no flush. So with heat or ozone, that water is used. There is no rinse water. Um, and that is what's ideal about continuous sanitization. Most WFI systems are continuous hot, at least at the tank, um, and purified water, again, there's a fair placement of continuous with heat or ozone. Intermittent sanitization, the more frequent it's applied, the better the performance is gonna be, 
the more automated it is, more likely the more frequently that it's going to be done. And what I talked about in that biofilm slide, the EPS that the microbes um, exude into to create the biofilm, um, that is a significant issue now. Sanitizers of any means you have to penetrate. Ideally, if you could oxidize or diffuse through so you need to inactivate the biofilm, and ideally, if you could remove it, would be ideal. Um, the sanitizing agent needs to get into crevices. So the bullet not common in WFI, that does not refer to ambient loops. A lot of WFI systems, the tank is always hot, um, and ambient loops are typically heated daily in most cases. Um, so. It simply means in WFI, the entire system being not under any sanitant for extended periods, uh, done weekly or whatever, pretty much unheard of. How do you determine the frequency of sanitization? It should be a risk-based analysis. And most important, what is the product risk? What is the water specification for the product? What's the likelihood of failure? It's based on actual data. It can be amended um, based on risk basis. Um, what is the production impact? So is a failure going to take a production line down and then a product is not able to be available? What's the history and what is the regulatory expectation? Certainly in water for injection, Regulators would not be expecting a chemical sanitization or a weekly or monthly sanitization. So the frequency has to be able to maintain the system in micro control. And this is an FDA quote in a, in a public speech um, that bad micro data, erroneous micro data may cost the pharma industry more money than any other item. In the point, the types of valves that are shown are a good sample valve, the tube protruding up into the stream. But you need to sample accurately to not be wasting money on sanitization or other maintenance that is not needed. So what do you want to accomplish in sanitization? It's subjecting the organisms to lethal conditions. That's temperature, chemical level, ozone level. Why do some sanitizations fail too infrequent? So the biofilm may be mature and the sanitizing agent is not properly penetrating the biofilm. The concentration of chemical or ozone may not be right. The time of contact, the temperature may not be there. Maybe it didn't penetrate. So there are many things that can go awry if not properly designed. And again, ideally, you would remove biofilm if you could. How long a system's going to be out of service? This is going to vary with size of equipment, utility availability, type of sanitization. But with hot water or steam, a mass needs to be heated up. The hold periods are pretty conservative, generally 60 minutes at a min. Some companies like two hours, eight hours. So Three to six hours is probably a common range. Ozone can be very fast. Even though the kill can occur in seconds, 20 minutes of contact is about as short as I've seen. So 20 minutes to two hours is a good range. If, the, if it's a one shift plant, you may see ozone on for 12, 14, 16 hours. Um, that can't hurt, but that's only because it can be there. The water's not needed for production. It doesn't take that long. And chemical is typically the longest preparation, introduction, proof, especially in distribution at every use point, rinsing. Um, it could be 12 hours. It could be a 24-hour cycle, depending on the size of the system. So when you're doing your choice now, when you're doing your risk-based method selection, again, most important is the product. What is that risk? But also, all sanitizers have personnel risk. It could be hot water. It can be chemical. 
there's production risk, meaning if the water fails, you're out of production. And there's time out of service, even when everything goes right, to accomplish the sanitization. That's time out of service that may lead you one way or another. And there is certainly equipment risk. So media can fail um, ultimately. So you need to consider the implications for equipment. Now, let's look at the possible methods for generation system sanitization. It is principally chemical, hot water, and steam. Ozone is not here because most generation unit processes are not ozone compatible. Um, and steam is very limited. Activated carbon units used to be done, a lot of them with steam, but hot water has proven to be better and lower cost. Um, so steam is pretty much out of favor in most generation systems. In generation, it's typically intermittent sanitization. Um, a still, as an example, is going to be operating at 100 degrees C plus. So a still is going to be in continuous sanitization. I've seen softener and carbon continuously hot, even some special reverse osmosis units. But most generation systems are going to be intermittently sanitized. And if other physical barriers, ultraviolet light, submicron filters, temperature control, chlorination, there are other means to incorporate in generation to minimize the frequency of sanitization. In generation systems designed for hot water, you can have every unit process be compatible. It's just a matter of cost. Um, you may choose to not make a multimedia filter or softener hot um, if they have good protection with chlorine. But reverse osmosis, ion exchange, electrodeionization, in many of those, they're not only tolerant, but often the hot water cycle is going to do less damage than a chemical cycle. So there may be prolonged life of media from hot water, there are no rinse out concerns. The capital cost though typically for hot water is gonna be higher than a system um, designed for chemical. But if you need really low micro, really low endotoxin, the, the hot water sanitization is certainly gonna be the most effective. It's mostly done at 80 degrees C, and those units can be designed for that or even a little higher. A 60-hour hold is typical. So that total cycle, heat up, hold, cool down, three to four hours is a pretty good range. There is a proprietary technology, a short cycle, that the heating cycle and cooling, a total cycle is about 40 minutes. And that's really based on data from pasteurization that uh, many pathogenic microbes at very high levels in food and beverage in 90 seconds, two minutes, two and a half minutes, there's an cycle. And here, this is simply showing data over a few years. Um, and the micro, the highest count at two CFU per 100 ml, that of course would be meeting water for injection and this system has now been in operation for about 11 years and it continues to operate at this data on a, a rapid cycle. Chemical sanitization of generation, it is typically the lowest cost. That means that some equipment may have PVC piping at the pretreatment end or polypropylene piping, materials that are not really rated at much of a pressure at 80 degrees C. The sanitization equipment, there may be one pump or just a drum pump or simplistic methods of introducing chemical, not a lot of instrumentation. Because of the lengthy time to sanitize is typically the highest labor cost. And no one would argue that it's as effective as heat. It typically isn't, but it is out in thousands of systems. So certainly the takeaway from this should not be the chemical sanitization can't work. For the chemical, a combination of parasitic acid and hydrogen peroxide 
is by far the dominant chemical. We'll look at a couple others, um, but that is really that combination peroxide and parasitic is quite effective. It is uh, compatible with media, but again, in some cases, it may not be as compatible when done on a very frequent basis as hot water. And with this combination, iron can be problematic. So RO elements, EDI devices, many um, types of media, residual iron should not be present, or there is a catalytic action with the parasitic acid that can be damaging. So that is a factor when using this chemical. In storage and distribution, everything is in play, chemical, hot water, steam, ozone, if it is chemical, it's going to be intermittent. If it is steam, it's going to be intermittent. You can't have a loop full of steam and be delivering water to use points. But the ozone and hot water, it could be continuous um, in the loops. Um, I shouldn't say in the loops. The heat could be in a tank and loop and go to use points. Ozone would be an added substance. That would be a violation of the USP monographs for purified water, a water for injection. So it can be continuously in the tank, but during production time, the ozone will have to be removed by ultraviolet light to qualify as purified water to go to use. If we look at chemical sanitization, again, it is typically the lowest cost not a lot of money, not with like heat exchangers or ozone generators and instrumentation. Um, the material, it's typically polypropylene piping in a lot of those storage distribution. There is significant labor. It's again, typically not as effective as heat or ozone. And most of these are purified water applications with a maximum action level 100 colony forming units per mil, no particular banned organisms, and it's typically manually applied. Although it could be automated to a degree, that's not normally going to happen with all the use point um, testing and rinsing. We've talked about materials of construction. The PolyPro is the most common in distribution, and the time you're going to manually open each port, use a test strip or some means to prove the sanitant is there, and then after the hold period, there, all of those ports are going to have to be rinsed with testing to demonstrate that the sanitizing agent is gone, or again, if it were present, even if it didn't ruin the product, it would be a violation of no added substance to have an antimicrobial agent in your finished water. So it has to be rinsed out, and that's typically a pretty high rinse volume. When chemical is not necessarily a good idea, if, the, if you are just meeting the USP or EP or whatever purified water limit of 100 colony forming units per milliliter, that's pretty achievable. But internally, a plant specification, a product spec may say no gram negatives, no pseudomonads, no Burkholder area cepacea. So if those organisms are present, then I have seen cases where after a year, two years, a little start of some mature biofilm, and then very problematic in some cases to keep extremely tight micro specs. And once a biofilm is established, removal is difficult. It, it's not very simple to do. We talked in generation that the combination of parasitic acid, hydrogen peroxide was the most common. It is again in storage and distribution. Chlorine dioxide can be generated on site. There's good biofilm penetration. It has some placement. Sodium hypochlorite bleach, it's inexpensive. It's a very good sanitizing agent. It's only compatible with plastic. So even though hypochlorite at a few tenths of a PPM in stainless may be okay, 
during normal operation, we're talking here levels of several hundred parts per million or higher, and that will destroy the well joints, oxidize them um, in stainless steel and cause you to derouge and repassivate. And it's not very compatible with most media back at the generation end. And if you have biofilm to get rid of, Sodium hydroxide, it's the best chemical for dissolving it, and it may take extended hold periods, 12, 24 hours, but sodium hydroxide can be very useful in remedial action for systems that have gotten in trouble. Looking at chemical sanitization, this happens to show a pump in place for introduction of chemical but there are many manual means to get it in if it is not automated or there's not a pump in place. And here now, the chemical is gonna be introduced typically into storage out through the loop. Again, confirmation that the chemical is at every use point. And here, this is showing an optional cooling heat exchanger that can be very useful to control the temperature in systems that are infrequently sanitized. Ultraviolet light or submicron filter, one or both, with temperature control, all of those can be great adders to ambient systems with chemical sanitization to reduce the frequency of sanitization. Hot water of storage and distribution, it's very common in purified, in ambient, WFI system. So let's say a membrane system to produce water for injection at ambient temperature, then storing it ambient and just doing intermittent heat may be very logical versus keeping the tank hot all the time and then cooling all or most of that water for use. Regulatory agencies see this type of design all the time. They're used to it. It can be lethal to every microbe in a pure water system. 80 degrees C is not a lethal temperature for every microbe on the earth, but those microbes do not make it into pure water systems. Um, some biofilm removal and excellent penetration and conduction into minimal dead legs at zero dead leg valves, crevices, gasket areas, it, it's simply very effective. There's a lot of success successful history, easily automated, verified um, with temperature probes. So there is time that we talked about, maybe three to six hours typically, um, some impact on utilities. And if you drop the tank level prior to doing a hot water sanitization, you can save time uh, and you can save steam. And the cooling heat exchanger, if implemented, then if the water is going to be cooled for use, there is no water dump. So it does add capital, but it does save water. And that water has just been heated to maybe 80 degrees C. It's in perfect microbial condition. It makes sense to cool it and use it. The way to get heat into a system, you can have a tank jacket with steam. You can have an external heat exchanger that is steam or electric. All of those are in use. They all can provide very reliable method of heating up the system. Now, an ambient loop in operation. Here's a storage tank. Typically, generation would be ambient. Here we have a heating heat exchanger that can be used for sanitization. That is not a must. So this is different. It's not chemical. It's doing it with heat and a lot of high-end systems do just this. The cooling heat exchanger, not only can it be used to cool the heated water after sanitization, but it maybe is going to maintain the water at 72F, 65F, 59F. So many systems operate with some temperature control um, to not get into excellent incubation temperatures for microbes, which can cause a faster rate of bacterial growth and distribution. I think that a cooling heat exchanger in systems like this, even in generation, 
is probably one of the most overlooked items in design of pharma systems. If you can control temperature and distribution and it's a clean system, minimal dead legs, then it, it really does allow you in many cases to reduce the frequency of sanitization, increase uptime, reduce cost. In this system, when it's being heated, obviously the cooling heat exchanger is off, the heating heat exchanger is on, and 80 degrees C is a very typical temperature. Some people used to be concerned about spore forms and do it under pressure, go to 121 C. From an ISPE standpoint, we don't think that that's necessary. And systems that work like this, a typical 80 degrees C, maybe a little higher, um, they work very well. And it's not normally required to do anything beyond that. Steam, it is really losing favor, not only in generation, but in distribution. It requires a continuous slope, full draining, sanitary air venting, um, eliminating condensate that may be multiple traps in locations. Uh, and so it really is not necessary. It used to be um, thought of as a GMP requirement. It certainly isn't. Again, the spore forms are typically not in play in these systems. So there are not many new steam systems going in because hot water is lower cost. Hot water can use plant steam. Here you need to use clean steam at, at higher cost uh, and more hardware to do it. So steam is a really small time player now and going out of favor. Now, self-sanitizing continuous hot storage so in a, it could be WFI, it could be purified water. FDA has stated, this came in discussions with the group that I am on that generates the ISPE water and steam guide. And we have formed a new committee and we're now working on edition three. So edition two is still what uh, is ruling. But FDA did say that they would accept 65C as basically you're always sanitizing. There's no dedicated cycle. They do ask us to state that, look, maybe you have a one cold area, one little longer dead leg. So based upon data, perhaps you should periodically go to a higher temperature but they're basically saying you don't need to stay at a constant 80 C and then cool it all to 25 C. That's a waste of energy. In Europe, in their GMP language, they refer to 70 degrees C as self-sanitizing. And the higher you go, it's not just energy. It's not just boilers fighting chillers. Rouge, nobody understands every factor of rouge, but but one of the theories is the higher the temperature, the faster the formation of rouge. It's a possible factor, but just energy alone, there's no need to go any higher than these temperatures for continuous sanitization. Um, here in hot water storage, if you can use all of the hot water, that would be ideal. In most cases, the water is stored hot, but the water is used at ambient. So here, this is a rather inefficient way to do it. The tank is hot. There's a cooling heat exchanger, 25 C, somewhere in that range may be a typical temperature for production. And here, all of the unused water goes through a heat exchanger for return to the tank so that the tank temperature is not dropped. And that will work. It isn't as though it's not GMP. It's just wasteful of energy. If we look at this alternative, this is really combining two points. One is there may be hot users on a dedicated hot loop and cooled users on a dedicated cooled loop. But even without the hot loop here, in this more efficient manner, we see hot water is drawn as needed from the tank. It's pumped through the cooling heat exchanger. 
ambient water now to the users and then past the use point, the bulk or all of the water does not go back to the tank, it goes back to the pump suction for reuse. And then on a sanitization cycle, it could be daily. Um, then the cold water is displaced, the chillers turned off, hot water is then put through the loop for a sanitization, but this is a much more efficient way to have hot water in storage and ambient water out for use. Ozone, the fastest growing method of sanitization. I'll try to keep moving along here, looking at time. Um, ozone or O3, a very powerful oxidizing agent. The OSHA limit is put here because this is a safety concern. OSHA does limit it 0.1 ppm, an eight-hour weighted average. Uh, and it's, it's not difficult to comply with that. There normally should not be any ozone in the room atmosphere when everything is working properly. You could have an explosive ozone mixture, but in water, it just can't happen. And I've been using ozone for decades, and I've never heard, honestly, of any serious incident um, involving ozone. So it's used in pharma water extensively. It's used in municipal water extensively. It's a good technology. It has the fewest placements because it started to be used so much later than chemical or hot water or steam. The growth is pretty good now. ISPE did put out a guide on ozone using ozone in pharma water a few years ago that educated a lot of people, it stimulated interest. Um, and so ozone growth in the US has been good. With the change of the European pharmacopoeia a little over a year ago to not make it distillation only for water for injection, but now in the European pharmacopoeia, membrane systems can be implemented. And in a document that that group wrote, and they are rewriting it, um, and it will be reissued, but it mentions several times that ozone should be considered uh, for keeping the produced water in a sanitary condition. So that's very good that a very conservative regulating group um, has not only allowed some alternative production methods for water for injection, um, but is promoting consideration of ozone. It can be more efficient energy-wise than heat. It certainly can be faster than either heat or chemical. And that's one of the beauties, the speed with which it works. And we're not talking several times faster, say, than chlorine. We're talking logs faster. Chlorine may be 20 or 30 minutes for a kill or inactivation. And ozone can be in seconds, and that comes from from many studies. And then on its own via half-life or with a proper dose of ultraviolet light, decomposed to oxygen, there is no waste of water, the deozonated water is used for production, and regulatory acceptance, it has been generally good. Easily automated, so where you want ozone and where you don't want it, that's control turning ultraviolet lights off and on, Easy verification, they're a good instruments that are online, they're a good chemical test kits. And the beauty of ultraviolet light, ultraviolet light, of course, is microbial control. The dosage of UV is about three times the normal germicidal dosage. So the UVs are uh, oversized a little bit, but now you have water in a very good micro condition achieved pretty cost effectively. What type of levels? About 20 parts per billion is the lowest level I've seen. That is a number that came out in that ISPE guide. That is pretty low. Not, I am not saying it's not effective. I'm saying not that many run that low. 50 to 100 parts per billion is a pretty typical range during normal operation. Then when the loops are sanitized, because remember the loops cannot have ozone in the water during production time, 
But then typically with the UVs turned off, the ozone level is ramped up 0.1 ppm to 0.5 ppm is pretty typical. Where most are done, that cycle may be as short as 20 minutes um, out of service. In most cases, the tank is continually ozonated. Now, in hot water systems, the heat may be conducted into the outer half of diaphragm valves at the use points and keep them under control. Ozone is not going to get beyond the weird diaphragm interface of a point of use valve. Some, most systems do not have regular use point flushing. You would base it on microdata. Obviously, if you have a hit, a failure, you're going to do something. You can directly run ozonated water into the room as long as you're in compliance with the OSHA atmospheric ozone requirements. If you think you need to remove the ozone or operators feel safer, you can use a sanitary hose to a small carbon tank and then the water that's leaving that tank would have no ozone in it. And ozone can be very good at biofilm removal depending on how mature, it just needs enough time to oxidize it. When you do an ozonated system, you really need zero dead leg valves. You need the ozone to diffuse into that dead leg and it's fighting diffusion against half-life degradation of the level. Um, so heat may have a slight advantage, but having said that, when ozonated systems are constructed, designed and constructed properly, they work very well. Um, there's not a lot of water for injection systems out there with ozone. That is primarily because it's the newest sanitizing method. And when we did the first ISPE water and steam guide in 2001, FDA, when they reviewed it, they actually made us discourage the use of ozone for WFI. No good logic. We simply lost an argument. Um, but now, with the European Pharmacopeia actually promoting consideration of ozone for WFI, I think the use of ozone is going to grow in WFI along with the growth of ambient temperature production systems. One negative about ozone that has to be part of system design, it does increase the water conductivity. So any organic material in the finished water, you're passing the 500 parts per billion TOC, but there's still some organic material when it's oxidized, the primary end point is carbon dioxide, which is conductive in water. And corona discharge generators can produce a tiny amount of nitric acid that can be conductive. So it does not mean that the conductivity will fail. The greatest risk is if you're going days of ozonation with no low conductivity makeup water. So it is a design consideration. Two types of generators, corona discharge makes it from an air stream, either pure oxygen or it can be air that has had most of the nitrogen removed. You can see the humidity and oxygen requirements there, um, and that will minimize the nitric acid formation. Electrolytic units, they use the pure water from the system as feedstock, and both are in many, many systems, and both work fine. So they're, they're both um, certainly can be considered. We talked about the sizing of ultraviolet units for ozone removal and the gas, that's what's off-gassing from the storage tank. There are units that either use a catalyst in heat or use straight heat to decompose it to oxygen. There are good test kits available that you can use to test ozone levels and also use to confirm that your instruments are reading properly, trying to move along so we can get to questions. The instruments, many manufacturers, all little twists, different prices, they're all pretty good. They all need a fair amount of maintenance um, in order to continue to be measuring accurately. So you're gonna put some maintenance into the instruments 
but they are going to allow your system to be fully automated alarm as needed. Here in an ozonated system, the ozone generator is on the tank all the time. The tank is protected, UV on, and the water leaving the UV. There's an ozone monitor pre-UV to prove ozone is there where it should be. Post-UV, it demonstrates that it's not there and safe for production. In sanitization, the UV is turned off. Not only does ozone now show downstream of UV, there's typically another monitor at the end of the loop to demonstrate that the whole loop is at an appropriate sanitization level for the required hold period. In maintenance, this would be an entire seminar. Every type of maintenance, or every type of sanitizing agent requires maintenance, heat exchanges, generators, instruments, lengthy time to flush quarts of chemicals. So they all require maintenance and that's a consideration. We pretty much have talked through the regulatory that there's somewhat of an expectation of hot water continuous or intermittent in water for injection, but ozone has been accepted and should continue to be. In purified water, all are in use. And even though I may have said that chemical is not necessarily the most effective, look, it's in more systems than the others in the total context, production labs, quality labs, R&D. There are lots of systems out there and when it's appropriate for the water quality, the right system design. Um, we would not be talking about chemical sanitization if it couldn't work. Safety they all have safety issues. They all expose operators potentially to something. So that is a big part of your risk assessment and obviously safety first. You can't do any sanitization if you're not doing it safely. In summary, you need to have some method available to sanitize a system. It may be done regularly. It may be done in a reaction to data it's a GMP requirement. The method and how the system is designed are critical. You're gonna do a risk-based selection and you need to decide it early in system design. The heat and ozone may be the most effective. They're typically gonna be more money than chemical. Um, the chemical is gonna be the lowest capital cost. Some of that is then gonna be eaten back with more labor hours to execute. Continuous is always gonna be more effective than intermittent, but intermittent can be effective enough. Um, and last, no matter what method you pick, that doesn't replace designing the system properly, operating it properly, and sampling. And now it is time for questions. And do I see any here? Mike, I'm not seeing any. Are you? Yes. Um, do you, you don't see the questions in the box? Some reason, I can't explain why, but I can't. Okay, no problem. Well, the, the uh, first question is, have you seen ozone sanitization uh, for WIFI um, when WIFI is used as the direct product contact in GMP manufacturing facilities? I'm going to say the answer is yes. There are not a lot of placements, but remember, there have not been a lot of membrane systems in water for injection because Europe didn't allow it. Unless the company did not want to ship to Europe, they couldn't do it. So there have been a small number of systems, but yes, whoever, if somebody did ozone, they would not be the first to do it, and I cannot say enough. The European regulators are promoting the usage of ozone for WFI. Okay, um, we also had a question about would this presentation be available for download? Um, the answer is that uh, all participants will get a link with this presentation available for viewing um, at a later date. So you'll have the opportunity to view this again and go through it again and, uh, and you can reach out to um, part of the uh, 
um, response. We'll give you links where you can reach out to Gary uh, or somebody at Avoqua to, uh, to help share any of this material that you may need. Another question uh, came up, Gary, about super sanitization or using uh, 125 degrees C or higher uh, periodically. Do we see that in WIFI systems? Yes, on occasion, and it's really a carryover all the way back to the 70s from the GMP part 212 that never got adopted. Um, and that has to do with spore forms of bacteria um, it takes typically 121 C to kill spore forms. But basically, the committee that I am on that writes ISPE guides, the expectation is with vent filter technology to the way, the way that systems are built, the chances of those types, um, those microbial forms getting in the system are so slim that many companies today, they're not even designed to do it. It would take um, a remedial action. It would take rigging it up for steam or to do it under pressure. But yes, I have seen systems, obviously steam can get to that temperature, but hot water under pressure, you just look up what the saturation pressure is for 121, 125 C, and I've seen systems do it, but they are rare. I don't think it's a one in a hundred anymore are designing for that. Just a reminder for all participants, if you want to ask a question, go ahead and hit that bar on your menu. Uh, that'll open up your question menu. You can type your question in. We have about six more minutes um, uh, for this webinar. We're going to get through as many questions as we can, but we will answer all of your questions. So please type in your questions. And if we do not get to it during this time session, uh, we will get back to you with an answer uh, to your question. So continue to ask those. Um, next question is, uh, what concentration of caustic do you recommend for uh, chemical sanitization? Yeah, that's a great question. First, caustic is not the sanitizer of first choice just for microbial kill. If you were just killing the microbes, the planktonic types that are floating around, a fraction of a percent, it would be enough pH alteration um, and chemical shock to get them. But when caustic is used, as I suggested, if you have a, a an ongoing micro problem and it seems related to biofilm, then 4% caustic is an ideal strength to basically, I believe the word the microbiologist use is suponification. In simplistic language, it's dissolving the EPS and the biofilm and 4% caustic um, is an excellent strength to do that. It will take a lot of rinse water. If any of you have ever observed rinsing out caustic, the rinse out is best done at an elevated temperature, 100, 110 F, if you could get there. Um, but you don't need the high temperature water for the kill, it's just helping the rinse out. By the way, Gary, we do, we have a whole pile of uh, really great questions here, so we'll be uh, excited to answer all those. Again, if we don't get to them on this call, we'll certainly uh, uh, follow up. Um, next question is, um, is biofilm also difficult to remove if the system is intermittently sanitized with ozone and heat? So is it just as difficult to remove if you're using ozone and heat? That is a great question because some oxidizing chemicals could be faster. Again, caustic could be faster at biofilm removal than ozone or heat. So ozone, it's an oxidation reaction. If you apply ozone to mature biofilm, it will get it. I mean, it could take seven days if you hadn't sanitized in five years or something. Um, so both hot water, hot water is partially effective. It definitely can remove some biofilm. It tends not to necessarily strip it all. The ozone for sure with enough contact ultimately would get all biofilm. But if, if the sanitization practices have been so infrequent that if you can if you can check piping or filter housings or things and scrape off biofilm, it's going to take some time to remove that much. 
Great, great question still coming in. Another one here for thermal sanitization. How do you clean the use points by flushing? Does this need to be cooled before dumping to drain um, or to avoid exposure to operators, which is a great safety question? Well, it is. And so in some cases, it, depending on insulation of use points, in some cases there's enough heat conduction into the outer half of the valve past the weir that those valves stay under control. In other cases, especially with intermittent sanitization, those surfaces stay wet, right? I mean, remember surface tension, those valves may drain, but ASME BPE has proved you can have something vertical and water is still gonna stick to the surface. So yes, some of those do with proper safety SOPs, protective gear, um, companies do flush hot water through drops based upon data and need um, to do it. So it can be done, but it is a great point that there's operator risk to assess and manage. Another great question. Would you recommend never sanitizing a system if there are not any bio burden or endotoxin hits? I wish they didn't ask this question, but it is so good. So here's what happens. I have seen cases, normally I am a proponent of some form of regular sanitization, even if that were annual, which to me is pretty infrequent, I would normally recommend regular. I have seen this happen. I've seen systems that went 10, 14 years without micro hits and someone decided a sanitization should be done. There was so much biofilm loosened, but not totally inactivated, that I can recall with one system, I think it might have been three months before the water consistently passed again. So when you do that, if you're really going to disturb massive biofilm and not, say, with lethal hot water, then you have to rinse, rinse, rinse. You're going to loosen a lot of it. It's not all going to be inactivated. And I've seen cases where vendors had to bring in like DI tanks to make rinse water because the production system, especially in a lab system, it just couldn't generate enough water to properly rinse a system out. So it is with great trepidation, if you've been 10 or 15 years and you've never had a problem, maybe best to just leave it until a problem occurs and then be prepared to put some serious work in to get rid of everything that you disturb. Gary, we're down to the last minute or two. I'm gonna to try to squeeze in one more quick question and then we'll thank all the participants. Um, this is another great question. Um, is it recommended to consult the FDA and get their input before installing an ambient WIFI generation system? I would say that it is, and I had someone yell at me one time that I used to tell them that when I would do ISPE training, sometimes FDA embraces it. In Europe, by the way, in Europe, it is a requirement to notify the regulators prior to putting in a membrane-based WFI system. So I'm going to say it's a good idea to call FDA. I have had a handful of people say FDA yelled at them and said, we're not consultants, go hire a consultant. I think that's a terrible response. So I think it would be a good idea probably to talk with the regulator if they would talk with you. But they should not be opposed. Look, in the US, membrane-based WFI has been legal since 1975. This is nothing new and ambient is not new either. Well, I want to apologize to uh, any of the participants who we did not get to your answers. Uh, um, we're great. Uh, we're, we're really uh, happy that we got as many uh, questions as we did and the quality of the questions have been excellent. Um, unfortunately, we just don't have the time. And again, we will respond to uh, all the questions, um, make sure that we address some great on dual sanitization methods, some asking about JP and, and others. So um, with that, I'd like to thank all the participants for your time that you've shared with us today. We really appreciate you participating. Um, Gary, a special thanks to you for not only um, presenting this material, but your decades of work in this area and your expertise is, uh, is invaluable. So, um, you know, Evoco would like to thank you personally, as well as all the participants. And, uh, and again, we will be sharing the uh, presentation with all 
uh, participants so you can view it again, and we will uh, respond with all your questions. And with that, thank you very much for your uh, participation today, and good day.